Buongiorno, benvenuti a questo Good afternoon and welcome, welcome to this meeting. The title is Rights and Duties at Europe 1979-2019. And it is, uh, well, a bit strange that in a day like today, we still talk about uh, long periods of time. But as we saw during these few days of the Rimini meeting, reasoning, looking at reality in a deep way can help solving concrete problems in a constructive way for our country and for the whole world. Today we are tackling one of the traditional themes of the Rimini meeting. It is one of the issues that is uh, most controversial at the time, that is to say, Europe and the European Union. We had here the presidents of uh, the European Commission. We will have a, a meeting with the Sassoli, the president of the European Parliament, uh, on Saturday. Well, today we are going to talk about this period of time, 1979 and 2019. That is to say, a few aspects that uh, were not at the center of uh, public debate. 40 years uh, since uh, the creation of uh, the European Parliament. So this is the right we talk about in the title. If we want uh, to be part of Europe, then we have the right uh, to choose our representatives uh, who can and must decide the future of Europe, just like sovereign states do. 1979, at uh, the time the decision of uh, sovereign people was important. Then 1989, thanks to visionary political leaders, Europe helped the peaceful transition of the Eastern uh, countries in Europe after the fall of communism. Eastern leaders, but also European leaders. Uh, we had here Lech Walesa a few years later when he was president of Poland. And uh, we used to, to read uh, the book by Václav Havel, the first president of uh, Czechoslovakia now the uh, subject of one of the exhibitions here at the meeting. In those years, democracy spread to Eastern countries in Europe, and many European con um, Eastern countries became members of the European Union. Then something happened. A few countries joined the Monetary Union, but this uh, passion for democracy in Europe started to decline. The reform, or rather the uh, creation of uh, a European constitution was uh, blocked by the Netherlands and by France, so there is no European constitution. There is uh, the Treaty of Lisbon instead. And then over the years, the idea of Europe started to decline until Great Britain decided to opt out from the Union. But also among those countries that uh, are still members of the Union, something has uh, been in a way blocked. Let's think about the debate in Italy in the last few years on the need to be members of a the European Union to have uh, euro as a currency. Important uh, mm, political forces uh, of uh, the Italian government, still in charge at the moment, voted against the new president of uh, the, European the European Commission. 
So there is some kind of detachment, which is partly due to the fact that uh, the European Parliament has not acquired uh, more power. We have a Europe which is uh, based on single states, individual states. So rights and duties. What are the rights? The right to have a parliament that is really representative of the people, uh, that uh, is uh, in a way a representative of certain intermediate elements that make people feel that they are uh, closer to politicians and then they need to actually uh, put into practice what is decided. Let's think about the great divide that there is in Europe on migration, foreign policy, economic policy. The European Parliament, a, a parliament uh, that could have more powers, could should be accepted or would it give rise to further divisions? So, well, the whole cycle that had been thought by President Violante is becoming crucial because in the debate, the debate between Professor Costantino Esposito and Luciano Violante, in order to accept some duties, you need to have more than rules. You need to to have some interest, passion. We cannot accept rules, even if uh, these were uh, commonly agreed, if there is no responsibility, participation, passion, cooperation. So there has to be the same spirit that there was uh, in the few years after uh, the Second World War. We. Uh, heard uh, the passionate speech by Alcide de Gasperi, who said, uh, if we do not build Europe, we won't be able to build Italy. Uh, so that was a historical opportunity for Europe and for Italy. So this theme of duties and rights and uh, democracy and uh, the acceptance of rules, well, this is a theme that is fundamental also with reference to the Italian crisis, because uh, we cannot have a, a new government without a clear perspectives on Europe. A new government will have to be clear on what it is ready to accept and what cannot accept. So we have here very distinguished speakers. We have uh, His Excellency Monsignor Paul Richard Gallagher, who is a secretary for the relationships with the states of the Holy Seat. Poi Enzo Moavero. Enzo Moavero Milanesi, who is Minister for the Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. Uh, he was uh, already uh, a guest here many times in the past, and I would like to thank him for being here, especially today, given the situation, the political situation. And then Enrico Letta, who is the president of the Jacques Delors Institute, among many other things, who has uh, come many times uh, here to the meeting in the past. Introdurrà l'incontro. The meeting will be introduced by Nicola Renzi, State Secretary for uh, Foreign Affairs, Political Affairs and Justice of the Republic of San Marino. Thank you. I'm really very, very happy to be here today once more to represent the Republic of San Marino in this very important event. And uh, I am really grateful to the president of the Meeting Foundation, Emilia Guarnieri, who has uh, supported uh, fiercely uh, the reinforcement of the relationship between the meeting and the Republic of San Marino. And I'm grateful because I have the opportunity to talk about this great audience, in front of this great audience, of some of the um, 
aspects of the position of San Marino in the European contest. That the title of this meeting is extremely important. 40 years from the first election of uh, the European Parliament. This is uh, an event that is extremely important for a Europe that has become a and the re-evaluation of Civitas Comunis as uh, something that is a part of uh, the peoples of the old continent and the development then of the following uh, com community right. And I don't want to dwell on the single steps of uh, a path of a united Europe that from the founding fathers has been faithful to its uh, roots in terms of aggregation between peoples and cultures. But I do believe that it is an institutional duty, including the institution of a country like mine, Republic of San Marino, uh, that is uh, um, going towards a deeper European integration. We wanted to recognize the single steps uh, to uh, that lead us to the idea of a European identity. Uni United Europe has created a feeling of belonging in uh, the uh, context of uh, citizenship, even if it is in a way controversial to Today, the uh, importance that is uh, attached to individuals uh, who is uh, seen as, for instance, uh, a, a worker, uh, as it is in uh, the free movement of workers uh, in uh, Europe, we arrived at the idea of a European citizenship. So we have uh, 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 the Europe of citizens that includes also the uh, Europe of the market and the European economic uh, community becomes the European community. And I think this is important to remember how this uh, idea of belonging has been uh, increasing through the uh, concept of humanitas that has recreated the cultural identity of Europe as a form of associated life. Uh, humanitas is the European uh, the uh, old continent uh, with his, uh, uni its universalism has always expressed the desire to uh, favor the inter exchange uh, among uh, peoples. And it is uh, still a bridge between the Eastern and the Western bloc. I would like to talk about uh, the uh, judicial uh, principles that are at the basis of the political union. First of all, uh, the democratic approach, uh, the respect for fundamental rights and the cultural roots that are uh, part of uh, the founding treaties. Representative democracy is a value of the idea of Europe, Europe itself. Democratic roots are deep in what we call the old Europe and internal uh, democracy is uh, a prerequisite to become part of the union. So the creation of a union of countries that are democratic is in itself a guarantee of peace and respect for human rights. And here we include also the safeguard of uh, the uh, features and characteristics of uh, single individual states. Among the objectives of the foreign policy of San Marino today, and as in recent years, we have uh, this agreement of association with the uh, European Union on the one hand and uh, the uh, with Monaco and Andorra and the Republic of San Marino. And when I think about it, I really am moved because this is a very important step in the history of European integration that could that um, puts together these three countries that are rooted in the context of European cultural, even though they do not, uh, they are not members of the Union. So um, the Republic of San Marino uh, has our, uh, uh, as the Pope said, and I quote. Um, the feeling is that there is a detachment between citizens and European institutions that are seen as something that is far away. And so if we actually underline that the man is in the center, it this means that we want to find that family spirit according to which every single member contributes with their own uh, skills. And uh, this is how San Marino wants to take part in the big European house. And uh, there are uh, different uh, steps. We've uh, just uh, seen uh, 
uh, first uh, the new parliament and then uh, the new European Commission. And I have to say that uh, in spite of all these changes, uh, the relationship between the Republic of San Marino and the European institutions still go on in a very fruitful way. Negotiations started in 2015. So we want to deeper uh, integration of the three countries in the European single market. But we also want integration in uh, the social and economic uh, uh, spheres. Lately, the Republic of San Marino has been uh, uh, a driver in negotiations in order to define an agreement that can be satisfying for the needs of a small country and guaranteeing a certain homogeneity in the single market. The um, EU key and the four freedoms as foreseen by the association agreement is now the most important challenge that the Republic of San Marino has to face. We wanted to have the best integration conditions and we would like to also have a very clear legal framework, but we wanted to preserve the social and economic characteristics of our Republic that in 2008 has become part of the UNESCO World Heritage. The Republic of San Marino hopes that the negotiations will be concluded at the beginning of 2020 or at, at the latest within 2020. We have already defined the uh, um, close, the safeguard clauses uh, for uh, our uh, uh, features and characteristics. Uh, we would like to have uh, the doors of the European single market open to us uh, with uh, the four freedoms granted to San Marino. But uh, we would like for our country uh, to have uh, a free movement, a uh, free establishment of people. Uh, and that means that uh, the citizens of San Marino can settle anywhere in uh, the European Union and uh, vice versa within a system of uh, a quota that has to be sustainable. So this is a, a, a reflection that uh, takes into account the particular uh, story of immigration in the Republic of San Marino. Let's think about uh, the fact that today one third of the people in San Marino today lives abroad. And uh, during the Second World War, the Republic hosted over 100,000 uh, refugees uh, coming from uh, other uh, uh, neighboring areas. Uh, so now we are uh, in uh, the final uh, phase of uh, the negotiations uh, that was marked by very uh, a very collaborative spirit on all the parties involved. So the Republic of San Marino, in a way, wants to testify its will of integration and reiterates the value of the rights and the duties of uh, representative democracy in while respecting the single characteristics. Of, so we look at Europe with a, a political and institutional profile that is very developed and in line with international parameters. We are part of the main white lists in terms of um, different aspects uh, that uh, concern uh, legality, for instance. So we do believe that with the participation of uh, all our friend countries uh, and in uh, recognizing our characteristics, Europe will be enriched by the contribution of a country, the ancient Republic of San Marino, that has a long history of democracy and freedom and is still a uh, an original model of uh, polis vivente. Thank you all. Thank you for your attention and, and thank you for this uh, intervention. La parola a Monsignor Gallagher. Now the floor goes to Monsignor Gallagher. <coughs> Minister, Secretary of State, uh, Mr. Renzi, Mr. Letta, Professor Vitti, dear friends. These are my very first moments at a meeting of communal liberation, and I'm really and deeply touched by the huge audience that I see here today. So I hope to be able to share with you some uh, reflections deserving your attention. Well, certainly, we have to 
reorganize the debate in Europe. And very often, it has been unbalanced with respect to the reclaiming of uh, rights. And uh, sometimes the notion of a duty has been considered in a hostile way. Pope Francis reminded that uh, to the European Parliament. So nobody seemed to make uh, the word duty go hand in hand with the word right. So at the end of the day, individual rights uh, are affirmed. Uh, even though it is left behind that every individual is connected to a social context and rights and duties are strictly intertwined as well as they are connected to the common good and the society at large. So, end of quotation. So, if we have a look at the European project at the end of the Second World War, we can notice that that project stems from the idea of creating a community of duties. So Alcide de Gasperi made it clear. And just two days ago, we just celebrated the 65th anniversary of the death at a conference in Brussels, considering the celebration of a conference delivered by de Gasperi in 48. So we need to work in order to make democratic action aimed at achieving peace. Moreover, he said, we need to have a reason-based and feeling-based reason. We need to promote freedom and justice and try to transmit that heroic spirit of freedom and sacrifice to United Europe. This is what led Europeans to get together in critical hours for the whole history of the whole continent of the whole continent. So the Gasperi outlines the pillars for the European project. So protection of freedom, justice promotion, and uh, peace creation. Then there is also solidarity, another crucial prerequisite in order to reach the other goals, because without that, all the other achievements are not possible. It may be considered as a competitor to be beaten. And solidarity is the antidote to domination. And this is a very important element in order to avoid the comeback of the factors that had led to the World War. However, the Gasperi talks about uh, a reason and feeling-based uh, solidarity, something very rare and precious, especially in our times, so that are strongly affected by emotions. Even the most delicate issues sometimes uh, are treated uh, in a sort of uh, temporary transient way, not really to suscitate and trigger reflections. So recently there has been uh, a strong shift towards uh, feeling-based solidarity that should remain strictly connected to reason-based solidarity. So to the Gasperi, this was uh, crucial in order to make it possible for the uh, European project to consolidate and develop. So solidarity, per se, is not good. I mean, it is good, but not enough. It is also characterized by active deeds and results. So solidarity is not based on uh, a compassion rejection mechanism that is uh, triggered by the other, but uh, it is based on the subjectivity of the common human nature. In Christian terms, you would say that it's based on the awareness of being part of a unique and whole body. So if a body suffers, all of the members, all of the parts suffer. So these uh, aspects uh, is also the link between rights and duties, because when it comes to uh, neighbor-centered solidarity, we need to acknowledge the value played by the values of any person. Where there is no such recognition, any program would lose out. And this is exactly what uh, has been uh, happening over the last 50 years. when the definition of some rights has been changing. So that brought about uh, new rights that sometimes are contradictory between each other. And that so paved the way for 
the modern ideological colonization, as the Pope uh, says it. So this is strictly connected also to the gradual exclusion of the religion from the social life. And again, this is the result of uh, insane uh, secularism that creates opposition between God and all the rest. Well, of course, we should make distinction, but uh, I mean, there is a possible harmony. And as uh, Pope John Paul II used to say, please, let's not forget trying to sort of consider the uh, roots of Europe and its deep Christian soul that laid the foundation of the rise of the peoples. So it is important to consider Christianity as a very important blood. But then, if we consider the existing fragmentation process that uh, occurred and that is characterized by individualism and uh, solitude, well, John Paul II uh, talked about uh, the family crisis and the fact that uh, the very same notion of family has changed. And moreover, there was a comeback of racism and also interface problems, uh, being selfish. All of these issues uh, are related to specific groups. So there's a growing number of uh, uh, people who do not care about the ethics and a desperate search for one's own interests and privileges. So these are words that still 16 years after sounds as a prophecy. And then a weakening of the sense of duty and the subjectivation of rights has weakened the very same essence of the European presence, of the European project. So if we consider the theoretical promise of such a project, we may say that over the last 10 years there has been there have been uh, several crises that have strongly affected the continent. First of all, there was the financial crisis, and then the outcome of the UK referendum with the Brexit that somehow put at stake the cohesion of the whole European project, and then the migra- migratory issues that uh, led to uh, the sort of weaknesses of uh, European countries and members come to the surface, without forgetting cultural and religious identity in a continent that is less and less Christian. So then you have populism that is just growing and increasing, and that increased the sort of a split effect between the peoples that feel themselves represented by Uh, that kind of approach. And all that mirrors specific uh, uh, political choices. Very often it is about uh, uh, site navigation instead of having a long-term project that tries to find sustainable solutions. I would like now to dwell a bit on the migratory crisis because uh, migratory flaws uh, are just every day on uh, the newspaper's main pages, and that links up with uh, uh, controversies and debates about also the notion of identity. I think that is evident to all of us to what extent such a delicate topic cannot be just tackled without a clear all-level political vision. But how is it possible to have such a split without a cultural perspective, allowing people to come to terms with a wide range of problems? How can we uh, sort of somehow have a right media coverage? How can we avoid uh, that uh, such problems uh, that have uh, such a heavy and serious social side do not end up in political disputes? And how can also uh, avoid that the rights of the migrants are perceived as more important as those of the Italians and that uh, the citizens of countries like Italy have to be at the forefront in the fight against uh, people smugglers? Uh, They perceive a certain sense of uh, powerlessness uh, that for a problem that, uh, in spite of the efforts for the vast majority, has not been solved yet. 
Well, if uh, we consider the people who are in contact with John Paul II, they will tell you that he's a very human person. And so is first and foremost a person. And usually that person seems to be less important as a human being. You have still to consider it, even if uh, sometimes it has not been adequately considered. And Europe could be an antidote uh, to some sort of classifying attempts uh, by the others. So this is the biggest contribution Christians can make to today's uh, uh, Europe, reminding that uh, Europe is not just a set of numbers or institutions, but Europe is made of people, and each person has their own dignity, or at least uh, has uh, an inner capacity to separate good from evil, or maybe a compass that uh, can guide us. And people have no names. They have faces describing their most intimate and deepest identity. They're uh, being in relation with the infinite mystery of God. So your name was born from what you gazed upon as uh, says this year's uh, mating title, taken from a poem by John Carlo Wojtyla. So the name and the face comes from the relation to God that makes individuals as people. And so we, then we have the Gaspari that outlined the uh, sort of key features of a uh, human in relation to brotherhood. And all that uh, is based on a millennial experience. And then Pope Francis says it is first and foremost important to acknowledge the other as a person. That means uh, trying to underscore what uh, we share and not uh, just uh, focus on what is different. So community is a key word for Europe because the European project uh, stems from the idea to uh, create a community of people that accept to somehow tie them together through specific constraints and duties. So in order to go back to the migratory issues, we should uh, sort of remind us of our duties. The first and foremost important duty is human solidarity because we know how many times uh, a pain occurs uh, before implying states and governments. This is a personal issue. This is, I mean, about uh, the key principles of uh, Christian charity. So I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drinks. I was naked and you gave me clothes. I was sick and uh, you uh, healed me and so on and so forth. So. Helping the other as a person is a fundamental duty, but not the only one. So that duty needs to be counterbalanced and cut off by other duties that uh, allow states to offer uh, immigra- integration opportunities to immigrants and also security to citizens. And uh, the Pope, for whom uh, people are so important, was very clear on that. So there are no no more important duties than others. So not, and so it is important uh, to consider that a lack of possibility of integrating immigrants uh, is a big problem. So it's better than not to welcome people because we cannot think about uh, an immigration without uh, rules at all levels. So of course, uh, there is a duty of solidarity between and among states. This is a key element uh, of the very same existence of the European Union. So therefore, we cannot think that uh, this issue is something that involves only so uh, cross-boundary countries. So it is also a domestic issue, so not just a trans. A, transnational issue, but we should uh, somehow state the current situation that is strongly unbalanced and the repercussions are under our eyes. Finally, it is important to remember that there is also uh, a set of duties by immigrants. They also have the duty to get familiar with the destination land. They have to understand the local cultural religious traditions, the language. 
And sometimes there is a sensation that gutters are created to avoid contaminations coming from abroad. This is a, a sort of a convenient solution that sometimes is looked for both by immigrants and uh, rescuers. And uh, this is a short-sighted solution that uh, sharpens problems instead of fixing them. So migrants have the duty to integrate. This is a great opportunity for them especially because then they can access a new social context. So they can set themselves free from the uh, dynamics uh, of their origin country. And sometimes uh, this is uh, seen also in uh, the destination uh, villages or cities where they remain separated. So again, this is also an opportunity to rediscover and reorganize one's own specific uh, traits and origins. Thank you very much for your attention. La parola Enrico Letta. Now the word goes to Enrico Letta. <clears throat> In the university where I work, a few months ago, we invited an agent professor who gave a lecture on the Asian perspective on Europe. When he talked to our uh, students, he talked about a paradox, and this is going to be my starting point this afternoon. In this unique moment, we have already listened to a very strong speeches and words that tell us what is Europe today and what is the difference with the yesterday's Europe. So that this Asian professor said, you European are incredible. You are living in a paradox. A paradox that is based on three elements. The first element is peace. There has never been such a long lasting peace period in Europe. You have uh, reached your uh, goal of uh, peace. This is an extraordinary result. Then the second element, you reached the uh, uh, top of prosperity, uh, the peak of prosperity that you have imagined to reach. The, Uni the European Union, its the citizens and countries have never been so wealthy as they are today. At, at the same time, you have reached another important target. You have reached the top of pessimism. So it's the three P's paradox, peace, peak, and pessimism. So this is a, a provocative uh, statement. We live in our societies in deep pe pessimism, even though we have reached the uh, top of prosperity, the peak of prosperity and peace. So the future of uh, uh, our reflection on the future of Europe has to start from this paradox. I do um, agree with uh, what uh, Giorgio Vittadini said with his usual uh, uh, attention, uh, we said we are for Europe, we are for integration, but we know that recently something went wrong in the relationship between Europe and its peoples. And this happened when we actually reached the final, the ultimate uh, goals of peace and prosperity. So uh, our reflection needs to focus on the future. and But we also have to understand why this could happen, why peace and prosperity did not 
leaders to uh, Europe that should be more integrated and more in line with uh, the expectations of its uh, citizens. So what is the key to actually overcome these uh, difficulties? Well, I believe that the key is also to be found in the title of today's meeting as well as uh, in uh, that number 40 that you see on the screen behind us. Uh, it's the 40th uh, edition of the meeting in Rimini, 1979. And uh, um, this is the same date that uh, Giorgio uh, mentioned at the beginning. Uh, uh, so it's uh, 40 years of Europe, uh, of European Parliament. Uh, the in beginning of the direct election of uh, the MPs, the e, European Parliament, and all the problems we have experienced lately since the election of uh, the European Parliament in 1979. Well, from that moment on, the uh, participation of uh, citizens to the elections has always decreased. It was 60% in 1979, and it was uh, only 40% in 2014. So there has always been a decrease. Then in May, last May, well, you can obviously have your own opinion on the outcome of the elections, but they anyway gave a very important signal because uh, these elections uh, saw the participation of uh, over 50% of people from 40% in 2014 to over 50% in this year. So that means that people want to participate, want to be the present. And it also means that citizens understand that this is where decisions are taken. So even those who, those who do not want a, a strong Europe know that they need to be there. And this is the reason why the meeting we are having today is so important. Because if this is true, we have uh, to make some step forward in our uh, reflections. Uh, democracy, which is uh, in a way uh, in discussion today, we have to ask ourselves how many citizens in our countries start thinking that maybe Putin and Erdogan are not that bad because, well, maybe um, less democracy, less rights, but at least they take decisions, so they find solutions. And I prefer to have solutions than uh, many, many words. So these are um, things that we can hear in many European countries, not only in Italy. So this means that the concept of democracy itself is uh, going through a crisis. So the key, what's the key to solve this uh, problem? We need to take into consideration the fact that today we cannot look at the future of Europe on the basis of the reasons that started this integration process 70 years ago, nor from the reasons that led to the direct election of the European Parliament in 1979, nor in 1989 to the reunification of the continent, of the European continent, East and West. Because the world has changed. It changed dramatically over the last 10 years in a way that was unprecedented and unpredictable. This is something that is changing our uh, reference points, whatever we're doing. And I was uh, glad to listen to Monsignor Gallagher for what he said and for his uh, uh, quote of uh, Pope Francis. Let's think about the change that Pope Francis brought about in the organization of the church at a global level. We were used to a church that was a fundamentally Italy-centered, Euro-centered, so to speak. Well, this is the revolution that was brought about by Pope Francis because church is now global. The cardinals that he nominates are almost always uh, 
cardinals coming from other continents, not from Europe. Pope Francis interprets for this sense of a global church, which is part of of a revolution that actually it's quite controversial. And sometime, sometimes it is even something that scares us, scares those who were used to uh, the church of the past, countries like Italy, France, Spain. Well, this change is a change that uh, concerns all the activities we we might have. After I left politics, I started working at university five years ago. And in these five years, I must say that I have noticed that there has been a great change. At the beginning, I thought I was going to, tr to work with the students and universities in Europe. But now, if I look back, I see that I have worked mainly with Asian countries, um, American countries, and African countries. So this is the changing world that make our European countries alone very, very small in this new world. So if this is true and if this change in 2019 has shown us the, shown us the future of the world in a, a, new, in a new way. And I'm saying this in these uh, days. We were going to talk about the G7 uh, hosted by the uh, French president and then uh, the G20 in, ja in uh, Japan. But we are actually moving towards a G2. In 2019, this G2 has become more and more evident. The two great powers of the world, the United States on one side and China on the other. So trade wars, but not only trade wars, wars. a world where we as a individual European countries, if we act individually, if we had uh, 28 Brexits, so to speak, or if those uh, who in Italy, in France, in Germany, in Sweden want for their country to, to uh, get out of the European Union, then we would be so small as countries that we wouldn't be able uh, to actually uh, be a, a partner of the United States or of China. Why should they listen to us? They listen to us now because we are together, and together we are strong. Together we acquire a different dimension, and we have uh, a certain leadership if we are together. Let's think about the environmental problems. Uh, this is an issue on which Pope Francis uh, expressed uh, his uh, views. Uh, his uh, words uh, have actually shocked many people. Uh, this is uh, something no one would have expected from uh, a pope that uh, uh, came from the other side of the world. But Pope Francis said this is a fundamental uh, issue. Nature, our, our earth, the uh, safeguard of the earth. And we know that Europe, Europe is a leader in this. The uh, Conference of Paris and uh, uh, this leadership uh, is due to the fact that Europe has always been united, even when Trump has withdrawn from these agreements. All the other countries remained because Europe was united and because of the European leadership. So I uh, mentioned this uh, issue of the environment because I do believe that at the moment there are two main, so to speak, new issues uh, on which uh, Europe uh, can prove its capability of speaking in front of its citizens, citizens and uh, instilling into them uh, a new desire to be European. So one of these themes is the environment that has always been at the center of uh, the Rimini meeting uh, over the years. And then there is another aspect, that is to say, another fundamental question on which everyone uh, is trying to, to which everyone is trying to find an answer. Because this is a question that I can summarize as a technological humanism. That is to say, this is the great challenge of the future. I do not believe that in the future, Wars will be fought on uh, oil wells or state borders, as in the past. 
In the future, wars will be fought on the control and the use of personal data. So what we are experiencing at the moment is uh, an invasive, so to speak, a technology that offers us great opportunities, but we all have uh, this idea that it is also a challenge, a big challenge, the question of uh, the protection of personal data, privacy, artificial intelligence. And I'm saying this in a very sad day. Tonight, a great Italian passed away. He was the one who actually um, contributed most to the protection of personal data, uh, making Italy a leader in the field of data protection. Uh, and he was actually the European, uh, the uh, European uh, a guarantor of this uh, uh, of this aspect, Giovanni Bucatelli, who passed away to Buttarelli, who died tonight, and I want to pay homage, a tribute to him. And uh, he um, is the father of a reflection on uh, the role of leadership of Europe in terms of. Uh, technological humanism. So I will conclude uh, in a way I want to try something new. I would like to ask you to take part in a reflection that I wanted to, to make together with you. If I came here as I did many times in the past to talk about uh, these topics and if seven or six years ago I would have asked you to think about the nationality of your cell phone. One third of the audience, if I had asked, do you have a European uh, smartphone? One third would have said yes, because at the time, the Finnish Nokia was leading the market. Many of us had a Nokia smartphone. Today, if I ask the same question, or if I ask today who has a US and American uh, smartphone, please, hands up, many, many people. But if I ask you who has a Korean, has a Korean uh, uh, smartphone, many people, Samsung, for instance, who's got uh, a Chinese smartphone, Huawei, again, many people. And if I ask you, who has a, a European smartphone? How many hands do I see? None. Well, just a few, so to, we should give them a round of applause. They are really very bold in their choice. So why did I involve you in this very small exercise? Because our uh, uh, phones are no longer what they used to be 10 years ago, uh, something that you use uh, just like air conditioning or uh, the washing machine at home. Today, our uh, smartphones are something different. They are our second identity. Here, there is our identity that has been stocked in a small chip, and here there is everything about each of us. So if, if you go in there, you know how I drive my car. If I drive uh, well, if I drive badly, here there are all the websites that I have served, all my, the, the telephone numbers that I have contacted. So if you manage to get into my phone, you get into my identity. And there has never been in the past, in the history of men, a place outside the person that could con in contain the identity of this person. So these are some uh, reflections that could not exist 10 years ago. Today, we have a second identity that is outside my body. And in a few years, there will be a third identity, that is to say, artificial uh, uh, intelligence, that is to say, a machine that will be doing things at our place. So why did I talk about this second identity? Because our legal system in Europe protects, protects us from intrusions against the identity that is 
inside our body, but it doesn't have any guarantee um, against intrusions on our second identity. But what is in this phone is me. And in the future, we will have to control these data. So the wars of the future will focus on that, because those who will control these data will win electoral campaigns, will control the markets, will be able to blackmail countries, people, and organizations. So what are the rules that can help us defend, protect these data. These data. So these are my conclusions that have to do with Europe and the future of Europe. And because at the end of the day, this is one of the most important reflections. But who is giving us, is providing the answers to these questions? There are three different philosophies at the moment in the world. On the one hand, we have the Americans. Many Americans are worried, just like us, and look for uh, answers that can protect our identities. But in general, the um, American system protects mainly the high-tech giants, the industry, the high-tech industry, more than they protect people. So the idea that we have is that uh, for the United States, the uh, competitive competitiveness of uh, their Silicon Valley industries is more important than everything else because they are threatened by the Chinese, by other uh, competitors. So uh, they have to win. And uh, uh, we cannot uh, create obstacles uh, due to uh, privacy issues, uh, protection of personal data, and so on and so forth. So the philosophy, according to which those giants and their competitiveness uh, is uh, more important than everything else is for us something that goes against my own idea of uh, individual protection because before the profits of these great uh, um, companies, uh, there is uh, uh, the protection of uh, the uh, identity of people, also the second identity of people. But in the United States, there are no rules. And uh, um, no one wants really to tackle this uh, issue at a global level. Personally, I do not think that this is an idea compatible with our uh, idea of uh, personal rights. Then in China, which is the prevailing idea in China, well, it is different from that of the United States. It is the idea according to which, through personal data, you can control society. That is to say, through personal data, you can avoid preemptively uh, that uh, someone uh, uh, chooses a behavior that goes against a certain, certain criteria. Let's think about uh, face recognition. This is something that is uh, quite worrying because of all the errors it might entail. And the reflection that is going on in China is based on the use of this second identity, these personal data. So I understand, I do understand the need for social control, but I, it's not our philosophy. This is not what I believe is important, because for each of us, if there is a, a violation of the rules, there needs to be punishment, but there cannot be a preemptive introduction uh, or uh, um, invasion uh, in our uh, identity. In, when I was a kid, I saw a movie called Minority Report, and uh, the the plot was exactly this. I thought, well, maybe it's going to be the grandchildren of my grandchildren who will have to deal with uh, these problems. But I was wrong because uh, now it's me. Uh, I, it's me that um, has to tackle all these problems. So why do we have a different approach? Because for us. The safeguard, the protection of a, an individual means that the individual comes first before the, the uh, profits of big multinationals or uh, the uh, uh, control of the state over personal data. So we, as Europeans, 
need to develop these uh, way, this way of thinking. So uh, we need to be leaders, just like we are leaders in uh, uh, protecting the environment or in the struggle against uh, uh, death row. Or for, uh, the fact that if you feel sick when you are on the street, uh, the ambulance comes and picks you up and takes you to hospital without, without asking for your credit card first. So this is the idea of our Europe. So what I said about uh, technological humanism is uh, that Europe and the European institutions, so with the European Parliament, as Giorgio Vittadini was saying before, is uh, this the sole parliament that is now taking into consideration these problems that are linked with technology. We do not want to hamper technology because technology means progress, but we need to manage it uh, in terms of uh, protection of the individuals because for us Europeans, the individual comes first with all the love and the, the, the admiration for, that I have for both the Chinese and the uh, Americans. But if uh, today's world and, uh, is divided between China and Americans, and we do know what kind of alliance we have, uh, what are our connections, but if Europe shouldn't exist anymore as a, a, the European Union, each single European country should have to choice whether to be a colony of the United States or a colony of China. And this is, in a way, the spirit of the meeting. And it has always been for 40 years. I hope that our children will grow up with the idea of being Italian and European without having to choose to be either an American or a Chinese colony. Now, the floor goes to Minister Moavero Milanese. Thank you. Today's topic is extremely interesting. However, in order to link up with the words that you used at the beginning, well, being happy about my presence here on such a day, so today after yesterday, well, having heard yesterday many, maybe too many harsh words, I'm so happy here today to be hugged by all of you and feel your hug. Well, Let's talk about uh, this 40th anniversary of the meeting and of the very first uh, elections of the European Parliament. Uh, make us think about a very interesting and curious uh, coincidence. And Georgia, you talked about the importance and value of democracy. And as a matter of fact, you're totally right. I mean, the decision to turn the European Parliament from uh, an assembly made of delegates of uh, EU member states to uh, an assembly with the members elected by the people of Europe was a courageous and brave decision, and that's why it also changed its name. It was uh, reappointed as a uh, parliament. And so the name changed from assembly to parliament. It was a courageous decision because that happened at the end of the 70s. Maybe those 
who are uh, older do not remember that. Those who are quite young probably do not even know what I'm about to say, just because they do not know it, because they haven't gone through it. Well, the 70s uh, were defined for the EU at the time as the Eurosclerosis times, because it seemed that the EU was paralyzed, that uh, the EU was uh, not able to adopt any decisions. The Council used to adopt decisions uh, unanimously. And uh, so from six to nine to ten member states, uh, well, that kind of uh, structure made it more and more difficult to reach decisions. So that kind of uh, dead end uh, was uh, overcome thanks to this decision. So there was uh, a quality leapfrog, and it was uh, a very good example of what we may, maybe, and could and should do in order to get out of this sort of Euro depression. So not only we had the first universal suffrage European election elections, European Parliament elections, but also we had the very first international elections of this kind. There were no previous cases of that same nature, and this is extremely rare. A few years after, so after that 1979, in 1985, the European Single Act is published, and that is the landmark document that led to the single market, the free circulation of people and goods, and that became the biggest and greatest accelerator of uh, prosperity that was so important for the European construction process. But again, I go back again to 1979, and I want simply to make use of your memories and recollections. That year was... Uh, important for another reason as well, because somehow we left behind one of the darkest periods of the history of Europe, the so-called sort of years of fear and terrorism. And at that time, well, terrorism was rife in Italy, but uh, that terrorist movement also had uh, international connections. So, so thanks to this European process, there's new blood that gets into the veins of Italy, and certainly those uh, European Parliament elections certainly somehow revive the confidence and trust in people, and this is also another crucial element. And then 1987, so eight years after, uh, after that, the European Single Act is signed. So the European Parliament moves from an advisory body to a fully legislative body, first of all for the European market issues, but then it started uh, making laws on any other issues. And today, so it is a key decision lawmaker for our everyday lives. So industry, agriculture, environment, health, these are the sectors that are dealt with by the European Parliament. However, you already heard that, uh, the participation rate of citizens to European elections is not so high as it is the case for national elections. Uh, well, there was a slight improvement during the last elections, but uh, unfortunately, Italy was not in line with this new increasing trend. And so this makes us think about this uh, paradigm uh, between uh, rights and duties, because we have the right to elect our European representatives, and at the same time, we have a duty to do so. And the European citizens sometimes are a bit sort of uh, forgetful, let's say, and uh, unfortunately, there's still a too high 
non-participation rate in many European countries. And so I would say that, uh, well, not everybody understood and saw that opportunity as a key opportunity to somehow perform some sort of indirect control on the functioning of the EU. Try to pay attention to that. It's not just about the media, but more or less our language today seems to have a detached attitude towards Europe. And Europe is always indicated as a, in a sort of third party. Europe asks us, Europe tells us, Europe imposes us. So it is a bit like if Europe was something far from us. Instead, we should consider Europe part of us. And it's a pity that we do not fully understand that because uh, this is somehow the proof of some sort of detachment of people from Europe, especially over the last 20 years. We know that uh, there was a sort of increase uh, in terms of uh, detachment and uh, these uh, process uh, seems to be gradual, but uh, this seems uh, to be due to some specific element. Uh, it's a disaffection process. Well, until some years ago, nobody would have ever, ever talked in a negative way about Europe. But today is different. So in order to better understand this, we should understand the leading causes of this disaffection. So which are the causes of this disaffection? Well, as usual, we can try to outline the key drivers and factors. And of course, then there is room for specific interpretations. Well, first of all, the timing. So the time required to build Europe has been longer than expected, because if we go back in time, 70 years ago, all started with the community of coal and steel. And uh, probably everybody was thinking at the time uh, about the famous uh, European state of Europe. Unfortunately, uh, Europe is far from becoming a federal entity. Then there is the frustration of a citizen electing European deputies at the European Parliament and then realizes and knows because he's being told and somehow sort of explained that there is no specific legislative initiative by the European Parliament. But the idea of representation is strictly related to the dream and idea of being able to make up and draw up laws uh, initially in the tax sector, but we elect uh, more than 700 uh, deputies that uh, cannot uh, take any law initiative. Well, uh, frankly, I think that this is a huge gap. We should uh, try to provide um, EU deputies some form of uh, legislative initiative power. So the fact that only the, the fact that only the Commission can take the initiative, well, is not that good because then too much power is concentrated in the hands of the Commission. It's like imagining our republic being able to adopt laws only through decrees. Well, we have a rather so tricky element there. And then a third cause of disaffection is generated by the positions of the government. Some started in particular, and not by accident, the UK. But then this trend grew and grew, and uh, so everything that is considered as not very popular, not necessarily pleasant, too rigorous, uh, a bit upsetting, used to come from Europe and used to 
so to be blamed on Europe, as if Europe, again, was a third entity. On the contrary, everything good coming for Europe was the outcome of a specific personal initiatives or fines and so on and so forth. But how is it so? So a sort of a bad mother Europe on the one hand and on the other hand, so nothing but impositions? Well, so for a long time, Europe has been represented as a bringer of constraints and limits and impositions. And so that is certainly one of the leading causes of such disaffection. Then there are the huge global crises we are still going through. And well, at the end of the day, we think about it. So the globalization is a something that actually is not uh, so recent because Columbus started sailing a long time ago, but the current globalization process has not among its main players Europe. Let's think about the smartphone example that uh, has been the object of the small test made by the previous speaker. Well, that is a proof of the fact that we are lagging behind uh, when it comes to current globalization. The economic and financial crisis uh, has been rife all over the world, but now we know that uh, growth is back in the US. Instead, Europe is still slow. And uh, instead, we have seen some uh, sort of uh, downward uh, trends. Uh, unfortunately, Italy has not recovered. And so there are too many imbalances, inequalities uh, between and inside states, and of course, uh, all that goes to the detriment to the smallest and uh, weakest uh, elements, not only in one country, but also within the social fabric of each country. And then we have uh, migratory flaws. Again, unfortunately, migratory flaws that are another big phenomenon that is not new to history have seen an absent Europe. Allow me to say so because uh, I must say that uh, over the last 13, 14 months, uh, there has been an attempt uh, to try to convince other countries to get together to create uh, some sort of uh, mechanism to let my migratory flaws be managed at European level. Because we know that, uh, I mean, uh, social and economic uh, growth uh, in a country reduces the need uh, to leave that country. And so it would be advisable to create uh, facilities likely to help these people somehow not uh, uh, end up in the hands uh, of uh, human smugglers. And again, we should uh, fight uh, in a harsher and more rigorous way against uh, human traffickers, uh, the people so that uh, traffic these people. But unfortunately, this has not been the case in Europe. Uh, still sticks to the principles that have been set forth and that uh, laid down uh, a lot of duties uh, for the immigrant destination countries, especially those where the immigrants uh, arrive as first destination country. And this is a problem. So, dear friends, we are talking about a Europe that is the vit victim of um, some sort of national selfishness and also of uh, nationalists. And then we can find new words to define this phenomenon. You name it, but unfortunately, nationalist Europe in the past uh, has ended up in terrible wars. So are we sure that there is no possibility to react to all this? One of today's biggest European problems is uh, the aging issue. So this is the grandma Europe, 
as Pope Francis said in front of the European Parliament in Strasbourg. So Europe is getting old, older and older that is not able to renew itself, uh, to tackle this problem. And so uh, this uh, old Europe is not able not even to help uh, households and families to boost the natality, the birth rate. Uh, and this is a problem because today Europe is literally old. And then uh, we are lagging behind in the technological sector. So the smartphone test made by uh, Mr. Letter is clear about that. But also I would like to add something to what uh, Mr. Letter just said. How, who, how many of you and uh, who among you knows which is the technology that manages and regulates the data transmission? And uh, do you know where this technology comes from? And uh, have you ever asked our, yourselves about, uh, I mean, the flaws of this data? Where do they come from? Where do they end up in? And when it comes to, I mean, digital control, what do you think about that? I mean, uh, data seem to be the most important element. And so it's not just uh, about, uh, say, manufacturing technology, but the whole infrastructure. And I must say that uh, we do not have uh, such important technologies. And especially the last generation technologies are those uh, that are, they are bringing up to the surface the great competition between world powers. And then there is another Europe that is asking itself a question about its own material safety, especially when confronted with surrounding wars, wars that are not so far from Europe. And also, we should consider our inability to self-protect ourselves because, well, today, for the time being, still the protection and defense of Europe is guaranteed by a system of alliances that was set up after the Second World War and that sees uh, loads of agreements with the U.S. There is no effective collaboration to be sure to have a good defense in case of conflict, but also when it comes to conflict prevention, we do not have such guarantees as well. And also when it comes to cyber threats and IT threats, again, we have no specific protection. And then international crime, international terrorism do also make use of such new technologies. So. Europe is faced with so big challenges, but uh, on the other hand, uh, Europe uh, has also some strengths like peace, uh, such a long and stable period of peace. So we have uh, never seen before prosperity, and so uh, there's plenty of uh, achievements that there may be impossible thanks to Europe. So how do we want to sort of react? So I will answer with something that is in line with, with what has been previously said, because I think that history should be our teacher. History can do nothing but uh, reinforce its union and try to rekindle that cooperation spirit that has been lost. Europe should uh, find once again its willingness to be sympathetic and to express solidarity to other countries. So Europe should show some sort of uh, softness, let's say, when it comes to accepting and finding compromise and also giving maybe legislative initiative to the parliament. So that these are the only ways to make Europe progress. Well, what if that won't happen? Well, I remind you history. If Europe won't uh, somehow move to the next level, you all remember what happened uh, in the Renaissance period when Italy 
was uh, really the cradle of arts, uh, of uh, bankers, uh, one of the best places in the world. But then, because uh, all interests uh, and eyes uh, shifted towards the new world, so at that time, Italy somehow dived into a deep crisis that lasted for two centuries. So the answer can be nothing but more union, but on the foundations that need to be modernized, reformed, and adapted to the ability to respond to the expectations and needs of citizens. Thank you. Per conclu- Per concludere l'incontro I have a very last question for Monsignor Gallagher to conclude. You talked about uh, the relationship between uh, Christianity and Europe. So the importance of religion, this is important for the Rimini meeting. meeting. So the uh, Christian religion, but also the cooperation with other religion in building Europe because we have always uh, said it is not true that uh, union means uh, losing one's identity. Well, thank you. I can just confirm that the European project is uh, still at the heart of the holy seat of the Pope of the Catholic Church. And I believe that in this, uh, well, difficult moment, Uh, where we have a crisis, but the crisis is also an opportunity in a way. The religion, the expression of a human spirit in the quest for what is divine and the response of men uh, to what is divine could be a way to recreate the enthusiasm, the energy that we need to rebuild Europe at the moment. But then obviously, We need to have a European humankind that has to be rich in all its expressions. This is uh, something that cannot be neglected. So, religion should not be at the borders of our uh, European effort. It should be its uh, center, even though we must respect the uh, beliefs of everyone. Anyway, religion should be a unifying force, a source of energy and motivation. And uh, since religion touches upon uh, the most intimate part of mankind, it has to become an important element in our vision for the future of Europe. Thank you. Allora, su questa risposta di Monsignor Gallagher, tra... So, well, with uh, this answer by Monsignor Gallagher, I can... Draw some conclusions. Um, uh, well, Monsieur Gallagher, in his first intervention, said very said some very important uh, things because he has uh, talked about uh, what happened before the creation of democratic institutions, uh, uh, the, the solidarity, community of peoples, uh, the objectivity of. Uh, Uh, man. So uh, during the meeting, we talked about the message of Mons- by Monsignor Carron, who is the president of the Fraternity Comune Liberazione, the idea that uh, everything is uh, solved on the construction of the s- individual. And we cannot think about uh, European democracy if we don't think about uh, who builds this. So as Vicoletta was saying, this is, uh, it is the individual who understands that something democratic is always better than any form of dictatorship. Um, democracy might have many faults. Churchill said so. But it's even be- it's always better than any other system. We need to have someone that really understands the value of a freedom of a, a common work more than a, a utilitarian value. 
if there isn't, if there aren't individuals, there are no, there's no Europe. And then I go back to what Nicoletta was saying. Why is Europe today strong uh, and stronger than many other big countries like China and the United States? The idea that the person is not in an individualistic element. And this is something that is lacking in uh, the uh, North American world and in um, most uh, Eastern countries. This is a European tradition. So if we lose this, we will create a world with great technological changes and uh, powers about uh, the chances of life, of uh, satisfaction, of living together won't be there anymore. So this is uh, the uh, great task that we have because they might uh, uh, create uh, smartphones, or they might uh, manage data, uh, but uh, in the th three uh, parts that were uh, uh, mentioned by uh, Enrico in this uh, unique uh, and uh, as, as uh, um, the Pope used to say, everyone has the, um, the right to have a positive life. Everyone has a value, not only those who make money. So this is a task that uh, has to be carried out by Europe. So if uh, Europe doesn't do this, we will be just like in the Big Brother. One exists only because it is uh, uh, there is something that is beyond the heart of. Um, and then let's go to the third speech that of uh, Minister Moavero Milanese. We can uh, today we can uh, we have a trichotomy today because uh, someone uh, tell us uh, in the future you won't have uh, the freedom. Sooner or later, uh, robots uh, will uh, take the the world in a way, and uh, everything is very pessimistic. Or someone will tell you that you do not count. Uh, uh, the single individual doesn't count. Uh, you need to have states. Whereas uh, Minister Mavra Milanese said that these countries, these problems, I'm sorry, need to be solved with reasoning, uh, with religion in places like the meeting. So this is a great opportunity. Today, we would like to say that we are not pessimistic, but we're not even optimistic in a way. We just wanted to give our contribution in 2019 to do something positive because as uh, Monsignor Gallagher was uh, saying, let's think about the values of the Gaspari. What would Europe have been without Robert Schumann, uh, without Audenauer, without the Gaspari, uh, without Jean Monnet? These are people, individuals uh, who over were able to overcome countries that hated each other in 1945. Uh, the Gaspari went to the peace conference in Versailles and said, the only thing I have here is my dignity, my question. So I remember when we uh, had here one of the uh, boys who in Tiananmen was in front of uh, um, Oh, was in front of a, a tank, and he said it was just me in front of a tank. So we have talked about different aspects that are that they could, in a way, look like uh, some uh, losing elements. But we're here to say that we, as persons, not even as a country, but rather as individuals, we don't want to reason and to face this big change of the world. And we are uh, sure that uh, this reasoning and this freedom that managed to recreate uh, the relationship between countries that hated each other and in, uh, well, could do exactly the same. Finally, Mitterrand de Kohl. when uh, Kohl and Mitterrand met in the war symmetry on the border between France and Germany and said, never again, they were two persons, two individuals with uh, their uh, uh, reasoning, their uh, freedom, their ideals, and they wanted this kind of change. So it's up to us 
we know that it is not easy, but we should not let this uh, um, make us uh, renounce this uh, target. Everything is possible in the world. La campagna di fundraising per I will just uh, um, remind you that uh, we need to help uh, the Rimini meeting. So, well, it is uh, uh, something that is for the people. So, uh, those uh, who uh, come to the meeting need to finance the meeting. So, please donate. <laughs> 